Good evening and welcome. I'm Yoli Garcia, co-founder of El Sereno Historical Society, ESHS. In the 10 years since our founding, ESHS has played a major role in researching, collecting, sharing, and preserving the history of El Sereno. Today, ESHS is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Through our efforts, El Sereno's history is readily accessible to the public via our website and social media. ESHS shares the history to empower all ages and community members. We have partnered up with our local schools to provide seminars and tours of our rich community history. Along with community partners, we have organized events and projects such as the commemoration of the 1968 walkouts and the beloved community mural and plaque at El Sereno Middle School. ESHS strives to build community pride and anchor the roots of our community members through the preservation and sharing of history. We are proud of our accomplishments, but know that there is a lot more to do. A priority need for the preservation of our history is nominating key community landmarks. One of these landmarks is the Farmdale Schoolhouse. Currently, there are no landmarks in El Sereno listed at the local, state, or national level. ESHS is working to change this by nominating the Farmdale Schoolhouse to the National Register of Historic Places. The schoolhouse has been identified by both the Los Angeles Unified School District and Survey LA as, as a National Registry candidate. In our recent community survey, which was a, co a collaborative effort with Wilson Mills Alumni Association and other community organizations, the Farmdale Schoolhouse was ranked number one as a local landmark to preserve. We took the community's input and decided it was time to add the Farmdale Schoolhouse to the National Register of Historic Places. And so we are here tonight. Thank you for joining us and being with us as we take this long overdue journey. Before we share with you more about this journey, I would like to take this opportunity and give proper recognition to our community partners. This journey is made possible not only by ESHS efforts, but also by the support and collaboration our, of our community partners. These are the folks that believe in our, in our work and have opened doors to facilitate the process. So I wanna thank each and every community partner that you see here on this slide. And I know some of you are present here today, so thank you um, for everything. Um, that you've done for us. Today's topic is the Farmdale Schoolhouse and getting it listed in the National Register of Historic Places. We will get started with the very brief history of El Sereno just to give context to the schoolhouse and its role in our community. Then our consultant Desiree Aranda will present more details about the Farmdale Schoolhouse and explain what the National Register is and its process. After, I will give you an update on our fundraising efforts and goals. We will end the night by answering any unanswered questions from the Q&A. In all, tonight's session should take about an hour. Also, it is being recorded, it is being recorded um, for us to upload and share on YouTube. For those of you who are camera shy, don't worry. The, it's only the presentation and the speakers that will be visible. We welcome you to answer questions throughout the presentation by using the Q&A feature. Some questions may be answered by us during the presentation, and if not, we will answer them during our Q&A at the end. So without any further delay, I pass the floor to Jorge Garcia, president of the El Sereno Historical Society to present the history of El Sereno. Thank you, Yoli. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'll be giving you a quick overview of the history of El Sereno. We have a lot of history here in our community, but for the sake of time, I'll be sharing a few of the important events and places that will also help understand who we are and put into context the role the Farmdale Schoolhouse played in the growth and development of our community. Um, so <clears throat> to begin, prior to the arrival of the Spanish, El Sereno was home to the Native American village of Osugna or Sud located alongside a perennial arroyo. This arroyo was later christened Arroyo Rosa de Castilla by the Spanish due to all the wild roses that grew alongside its banks. The flowers reminded them of flowers native to Castile, Spain. It's important to note that the Portola expedition of 1769 traveled through El Sereno as they explored California. 
<clears throat> also, one of the original 36 adobes built in California by the Spanish was located at or near the village of Osuna. Uh, this historic adobe was lost to a fire during the filming of an early silent movie in 1908. <clears throat> Um, after Mexican independence from Spain, 1821, Rancho Rosa de Castilla was granted to Juan de Dios Ballesteros in 1831. He was the regidor of the Pueblo Los Angeles from 1823 to 1824. The rancho was named after the stream running through the area, Arroyo Rosa de Castilla. A little historical fact, during the Mexican-American War, U.S. soldiers camped at the rancho, damaged the adobe, and ruined the property. After California became part of the United States, Rancho Rosa de Castilla was acquired around 1850 by Anacleto Lestrade, a priest uh, in Our Lady of, the, of Angels Church. In 1852, Jean-Baptiste Batts and his wife, Catalina Batts, acquired the Adobe Ranch House from Lestrade. Jean and Catalina Batts were French Basque immigrants who, who came to California by way of Argentina. Jean Baptiste engaged in farming and sheep ranching until his death in December 6, 1859. Under the Homestead Act, Catalina Batts received official title to the 160 acres upon which the adobe stood in 1876. She proceeded to purchase the land from the surrounding owners. Here we have a picture of the rancho, uh, the sheep. Um, rancho period. So the Batts family is pictured above and joined a summer garden party in 1870. And on the right is Jose Domingo Bats and his family at Rancho Rosa de Castilla around 1899. It's important to note that all the children pictured here attended the Farmville School. <clears throat> the Arroyo. Catalina Bats lived until February 22, 1882. Under her leadership, the ranch eventually encompassed a total of 3,283 acres of land. Her success was largely due to the Arroyo Rosa de Castilla. This perennial stream gave her year-round access to much needed water. Also, this stream still runs. If you ever get to the southbound 710 and look to your right, you'll see a channel, concrete channel uh, with water in it. That's the arroyo that still flows because uh, it's a perennial spring. It's a year-round spring. So it's still there. It's just, uh, you know, we haven't really promoted it as much as we should. <clears throat> In the late 1890s, with the arrival of the Baird brothers, land began to be acquired for the purpose of real estate development. George Baird became a prominent figure in the area, buying much of the land that, would first, that was developed into housing tracks. Through his friendship with Henry Huntington, the Baird Railroad Station was created along the Pacific Electric Line. Soon, <clears throat> more people began to settle in what is later known as Bairdstown. Here we have a picture of Bairdstown beginning 1904, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Bearstown Post Office, uh, located on what is now Eastern and Huntington Drive, 1905. Also an early days photo of Incidental's horse race track. This was photos taken from um, Little Hill, looking towards Huntington Drive. What is now Food for Less would be in front of us with the back hill being Elephant Hill, 1904. <clears throat> In 1902, Pasadena Short Line was opened along Los Angeles Pasadena Boulevard, now Huntington Drive. Here's a photo of El Sereno with uh, its fields and its open land for grazing. We're looking towards Huntington Drive and East Eastern. Sorry. <clears throat> it's okay. There's a Bearstown Station, uh, 1904. Its location is what is now the post office here in El Sereno uh, by the Chase Bank. Encereno is also unique in that it had only one of, of two four-track P&E Pacific Electric lines. This unique feature allowed it for the two inner tracks to be express lines for commuters traveling from Pasadena and San Gabriel Valley to downtown LA, while the two other tracks allowed for the local stops in El Sereno. This four-track system ran through El Sereno from the Soto Street Bridge to Sierra Vista Station. Here's a photo of it, 1935. Um, here is a Pacific Electric trolley, along, trolley rolling along Huntington Drive towards Eastern Avenue. 1951 was the last year where the P&E red car trolleys rolled. Soon after, the system was decommissioned and the tracks were abandoned. <clears throat> the historic Farmville Schoolhouse was built in 1894. 
The Farmdale Schoolhouse is one of the oldest schoolhouses still in use in Los Angeles Unified School District. It was restored and dedicated as a museum in 1976. Many of its former students attended the ceremony and items of the area, the early 1900s, were donated to be displayed at the museum. Desiree will talk more about this in her, in her, in her part, but the historic Farmdale Schoolhouse can be seen behind the newer Farmdale Elementary School in the 1920s. This site served as Farmdale Elementary until 1936, when construction of the new area middle and high school began. Farmdale Elementary was then moved to its current location near the park. <clears throat> Wilson Senior High School was first opened its doors in 1937 in what is now its Isereno Middle School. Classes were separated into winter and, and summer and were first held in tents and old bungalows until the building was completed. The first gym was designed right after World War II and completed in 1942. The first class to graduate was in the winter of 1940 with a class of 40 students. Pictured here is Wilson High School, Senior High School under construction 1969. In 1970, Woodrow Wilson High School moved to its campus to the top of Mount Noma Street. <clears throat> Woodrow Wilson Senior High School uh, is pictured here shortly after it opened in 1970. On a clear day to the south, you can see Canada, Canada Island and to the north, Mount Baldy. Once Wilson opened its new, its new doors, it became the major landmark of El Sereno. Woodrow Wilson Senior High School was designed by California architect Paul Williams. It became the first five-story high school in the district. It was originally designed to accommodate handicapped students, providing elevators and escalators in our buildings. Tonight's meeting is about the historic Farmdale Schoolhouse, the granddaddy to all the schools in El Sereno. It was the first school in our community, and from it, from its original location, has risen Wilson High School, El Sereno Middle School, and Farmdale Elementary. It's important to preserve this beautiful legacy of education in El Sereno. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed the short overview. Thank you, Jorge, for sharing um, the history, just very brief history of El Sereno. We have a lot more to share. And um, today, of course, our focus is the Farmdale Schoolhouse. So next, we have our consultant, Desiree Aranda, and she will present more on the old Farmdale Schoolhouse and the National Register. Desiree? Hi everyone and good evening. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I don't know if you want my video on, but I did um, try to start it, but I, I wasn't able to. Um, but in any case, I'll go ahead with the slides. So um, as Jorge mentioned and Yuli mentioned, I was brought on by the El Sereno Historical Society to prepare a National Register of Historic Places or National Register for short uh, nomination for the Old Farmdale School. Um, so before I begin and delve into the history and architectural significance of the school itself, um, I wanted to provide just a little bit of background on the National Register of Historic Places um, program. So the National Register is the official list of the nation's historic places that are worthy of preservation. It was authorized by the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 and is overseen by the National Park Service. Enlisting in the National Register provides formal recognition of a property's historical, architectural, or archeological significance based on national standards that are used by every state. There we go. Thanks, Yoli. Okay, um, so how are these properties evaluated and determined eligible for the National Register? Well, they must meet uh, a set of National Register criteria um, and that involves three main components, the first being age. They should be at least 50 years old. Typically, there are some exceptions to that, um, but they also should have historic or architectural or archaeological significance. Um, so do they are, they, are the properties associated with important people in the past, um, important historical events or patterns, um, or are they significant to architectural history, um, et cetera? Um, and then they also must contain um, or maintain integrity. So um, and integrity, integrity is measured in different ways, but basically does the property you know, look uh, like it did during its period of significance. And all of these um, uh, measures you know, have, uh, the Farmdale School meets all of these measures and criteria. 
Uh, so now we'll dive into the historical significance of Old Farmdale School. Um, and I call it the Old Farmdale School because the, as Jorge mentioned and provided that wonderful background and context, there was a new Farmdale Elementary School um, constructed. So this, this one became known as Old Farmdale School. So the building itself was constructed in 1894. Um, however, the Farmdale School District itself um, began in 1889, and um, this was part of nas uh, national trends in public education. Um, so uh, in the late 19th century, Farmdale was a small rural ranching community in unincorporated Los Angeles County. Its residents included American Indians, Spaniards, Californios, Basques, Mexican Americans, and some with ties to that former San Gabriel mission and later the Rancho Rosa de Castilla, which Jorge had talked about. Um, so when the school district was established by 1889, um, a temporary, most likely a temporary schoolhouse was built um, for use by the students. And then in 1891, the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors solicited bids for bonds to fund the construction of a new school building for the Farmdale School District. Voters overwhelmingly supported that bond measure and approved the bond. Uh, and so uh, over the next few years, the permanent schoolhouse was completed. And this was very much um, in alignment with national patterns um, at the time when the concept of uh, public education was gaining momentum. Because prior to that, prior to the 19th century, most children received an education at home, if at all. Generally, only the children of wealthy or you know, upper middle class families were educated outside the home at subscription or private schools um, or religious schools at, or with you know, private tutors. Otherwise, most poor children um, did not receive um, education in the way that you know, we, we see it see it today. Most just entered the workforce. So the Bats family um, is pictured here and Jorge talked a bit about them earlier. The French Basques who arrived in California from Argentina and their children attend in the school. Next please. Here's another photograph of students and teachers um, from 1905. Um, they're sitting or standing outside of the old Farmdale school in schools of this type and period typically had only one teacher and maybe an, an assistant. Sometimes one of the older students was the assistant. Next slide. Here's another photo class photo from the same year. Um, the students look a bit younger. So my guess is that perhaps maybe there were two classes um, because this school building had two classrooms and typically um, rural American schoolhouses of the 19th century only had one uh, classroom. So this was kind of an upgraded um, fancier rural schoolhouse. So it is possible um, they had two separate classrooms or you know operated in two separate classrooms, um, or maybe they just couldn't fit all the, the kids in one photo, I'm not sure. Um, but eventually, um, or typically everyone received education in the same classroom. So children of different ages would be instructed all together at the same time. And it was customary for older children to help teach the younger ones. At Farmdale, um, students ranged in age from five to 17, and they came from the surrounding areas. So many were, you know, ranching, the children of ranching families. They either walked to school or others arrived via horse and buggy. Between 1894 and 1911, the old Farmdale school was the only school in the district that serves this, this area. Next, please. Thank you. Um, so here's a photograph of children inside the schoolhouse, and this was taken in 1911. So the students would have learned the basics, spelling, reading, writing, arithmetic. Uh, many of the students were English language learners, um, as you know, many of their parents or families were immigrants. And around this time, uh, as well, Los Angeles initiated a process of annexation and school consolidation or district consolidation. Um, this was also in keeping with nas national patterns um, in the American educational system at the time. At the turn of the century, increasing attention was given to 
the quote unquote rural school problem. President Theodore Roosevelt in 1908 launched the National Commission on Country Life to identify solutions to rural problems or you know, perceived rural, rural problems. And schools in particular in the rural areas were deemed inadequate and um, were seen in need of reform. So educational reformers of the time, this was a big movement to reform rural schools. So state legislatures offered increased funding for consolidating schools. And then as a result, many school districts began to consolidate together and um, a significant number of these one room schoolhouses were demolished throughout the country. The annexation process for the Farmdale School began in 1909 um, and was actually kind of um, started by some local parents. So part of the school district consolidated under Los Angeles City School District as it was previously known. And then by 1915, the whole Farmdale School District became part of the LA City School District. Next, please. Thanks. So in the 1920s and 30s, unified school campus plans or open air schools that emphasize large campuses and landscape elements were dominant trends in school architecture. We also had you know, significant population growth at this time in Los Angeles and in un unincorporated parts of Los Angeles and in this area in particular. So more schools were needed, larger schools were needed, um, and this kind of became um, the trend. So in 1923, LAUSD debuted a new Farmdale Elementary School. Um, as Jorge mentioned earlier, it was moved um, to south of the current um, 1894 schoolhouse. And then in the 30s, uh, the school and its surroundings became part of El Sereno High School, area high school, changing its name to Woodrow Wilson High School the following year. And over the next several years, new school buildings, some including some that were funded by the New Deal, were added to the campus. Next, please. Here's a photo of the old Farmdale School in the background, um, and this photo is from 1966 when it was part of Woodrow Wilson High School, and the building was used for wood shop class. Um, and then when uh, Wilson High School relocated in 1970, the campus became El Sereno Middle School as it's known today. Next, please. So that's um, its, art, its historical significance. Basically, it's it's a very important part of um, this area, Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, really their early educational uh, system, their public education system. Um, the school building also has architectural significance. It's an outstanding example of a 19th century rural American schoolhouse. It was specially designed by the architectural firm of Bradbury and Ferris, um, which as I mentioned, um, was quite rare for the time Typically, these schools were constructed by uh, local builders, or were um, the design was taken from a uh, like a design book, kind of mass-produced design book. So this one it makes it even more special because it's unique. Several um, some of its character-defining features that convey its architectural significance as a representative example of its property type include its wood frame construction, its one-story massing. Um, it's two classrooms with the entry vestibule, it's um, side gable and hipped roof forms, it's open bell tower, um, it's wood siding, and it's wood frame windows. Next, please. Here's a photo, a uh, couple photos of its original cast metal bell. Um, the image on the right I thought it was interesting because because it's a newspaper article from 1928, and at that time, already by 1928, the newspaper is noting the um, the rarity of these school these old school ding dong bells. So even by 1928, um, this is considered you know an old style school. Next, please. Here's the floor plan, just so you can see, um, it has the main classroom and then a smaller classroom, the entry vestibule where the students would have entered. Next, please. Here are some photos of the interior. So this is that entry way. Next, please. Here's the main classroom. 
And where that butcher, that like yellow, bright yellow butcher paper is, um, there are like built-in blackboards that are original to the school. So there are several of those blackboards that are around the interior of the classroom. Next. Here's another view of the interior. And uh, when Jorge, Jorge mentioned the, how the building was restored in the 70s and turned into a museum, um, so the, the building itself was moved, but it was moved within the same campus. So it wasn't moved very far and it was restored um, to how it was originally designed using original materials. In some cases, the materials were replaced, but they were replaced with the in-kind or the like-for-like like materials. Um, so every, for the most part, you know, everything you see is original. Obviously, there are upgrades, um, mechanical and that kind of thing. Next. And then you have this really cool um, wood burning stove, which was very typical of these rural school houses. Those, that was the only source of heat um, you know, during the winter. So next, please. Um, so that concludes my presentation on the architecture and historical significance of the Farmdale School House. Um, so next steps, the nomination has been submitted to the California Office of Historic Preservation. And so that office reviews the draft. Once they um, finalize it or, or approve it, it would be placed on the agenda for the California State Historical Resources Commission. And we're aiming for the April 29th meeting. And at that point, um, the state will notify the property owner, which is the Los Angeles um, Unified School District and the city of Los Angeles and solicits public comment. And then if this, um, the commission, the state commission approves the nomination, it's forwarded to the keeper of the National Register of Historic Places for final approval and listing. Next. After listing, um, assuming everything goes as, you know, goes as planned, which I think, it, you know, have no doubt that it will, um, this property would become part of the National Register archives, um, opportunities for preservation incentives, federal grants and other privately funded grants might become available. Um, other, there are other incentives that become available to um, listed properties. Um, involvement by the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, if a federal agency um, project might affect the historic property. So if there's any type of federal funding involved in, say, a campus upgrades or anything like that, then um, certain guidelines would need to be followed to make sure that the building is preserved. Um, and then, of course, you could uh, it qualify for a, a bronze plaque that you might have seen at, at other historic sites um, that distinguishes the property and educates people about it. Next. Um, one thing that is important to mention that um, if the site is not owned by a federal agency and if there's a project but there's no federal funding involved, um, it is possible for a property that's listed on the National Register to be demolished or to be um, insensitively altered. Um, the National Register is honorific and it does provide some protections when there is that federal funding involved, um, but it's not as a strong, it doesn't have as strong regulate, regulatory protections as say is um, local, um, local listing. So that's just something to be aware of in general. Next, please. Um, and then finally, how to support, um, you can submit a letter or an email to the California State Historical Resources Commission when the time comes, um, it is still a little bit early, but once the, the item, the Farmdale Schoolhouse is um, placed on the agenda on the calendar closer to April um, would be a good time to submit you know, emails and things like that. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you all so much uh, for this opportunity to work on this project. It's really exciting that the Historical Society is putting forth its first National Register nomination. So I want to commend you all and, and congratulate you. Thank you, Desiree, for um, taking the time to join us and for explaining the whole process and the next steps. As you can see, this project takes months to complete. We actually began having conversations with LAUSD in February, March of last year. And with their support, we started planning and got to work 
our fundraising efforts include a GoFundMe campaign and, and, grants, and grant submissions. In our GoFundMe campaign, our goal is $4,000 and we're almost there. Thanks to our donors, um, we're very close at reaching that goal. However, the GoFundMe goal is just part of the total project cost. We didn't make the whole project cost our goal in the GoFundMe because we also submitted grants and funding requests to meet our total budget of $16,500. Some may be wondering why so much. A lot of time goes into the research and completion of the application. Our consultant, Desiree, she has dedicated over 70 hours of work and she still has hearings to attend. We believe that the schoolhouse is a qualifying candidate and also plan to install a bronze plaque and have a celebration ceremony once the process is completed. We hope to be able to have an in-person event at the schoolhouse itself to celebrate. Because of the pandemic and the nomination timeline, we're looking at some time in the summer, if all goes well. And um, all funds are going towards consultation fees, events, expenses related to this project, plaque and installation, okay? There is still time for, for you to financially contribute. You may visit our website for more information. Our website's listed here on this slide. Um, just so you know, there are several ways um, that you may donate. You could donate with the GoFundMe link that you see here or with the GoFundMe QR on the bottom left corner. If you prefer PayPal, on the right-hand corner is the PayPal QR. If you do Venmo, our handle is at El Sereno History. And for those who still write checks, um, our PO Box address is on the slide in case you um, would like to mail us a check. Um, so thank you so much for those who have contributed already. And, um, you may continue to follow this project by staying connected to our social media on Facebook or Instagram. We are a 501c3 nonprofit and your donation is tax deductible. And we are still fundraising. Um, and, and again, the funds are to cover consultation fees, plaque, dedication, events, and expenses related to this project. If we're fortunate enough to have a surplus, you may rest assured that it will go towards our next preservation projects. And we do have a few lined up after the Farmdale Schoolhouse. Okay, so if um, you would like to add your name to our list of donors, um, you can get more information, as I said, on our website. And um, I do wanna give special thanks to those of you who have already donated. Thank you. There is um, no amount is too little or too big. And thank you to all of our um, community partners that you see here who have also uh, contributed financially. Okay. So thank you to everyone here. And then once again, I'm gonna go to this slide in case you need the QR code. And we are gonna be uploading this presentation on YouTube and we will give you more information to follow and we'll share this also on our website, okay? So once again, thank you to our donors. Now, um, to the last session of our presentation is the Q&A. If you still have questions, please ask using with the QA features. I'm gonna ask at this moment for um, my panelists and for our board members who are behind the scenes um, to help me in this part in identifying questions that um, attendees may have asked that have not been answered. Okay, here we go, we have a question here. Okay, so we do have a question. Will there be plans to host tours once the pandemic is over? Thank you for asking that question. That is actually something that we do have in our plans um, to eventually have um, scheduled tours at the Farmdale Schoolhouse. Right now with the pandemic, it, it is um, a bit challenging, but it is something that we want to have in the future to have scheduled, you know, maybe um, once a month, um, open up the schoolhouse to offer tours to the public. Thank you for asking that. Anything else you would like to add, Jorge? Or uh, anything yes. Else? Well, you know, um, we want to make it back into the museum that it used to be and have tours for students as well as the public. And hopefully um, on weekends, it be for the public and for the on, on the school days for the for the middle school students that are there. Um, so that'd be great to have once the pandemic 
um, it's a little bit more subsided, hopefully. Okay. All right. So I want to thank everybody for joining us here tonight. Um, we're going to stick around a little bit longer if anybody else has a question. I hope you have enjoyed the presentation and we are um, extremely grateful for you and um, for your support and just helping us share the history of El Sereno. And um, I look forward to you know, having our first um, landmark on the National Register. Um, you know, El Sereno doesn't have any and we definitely um, have sites um, that are worthy of being on the National Register. So. Thank you so much for everything. Adam, I'm gonna wait a little more for more questions. And again, thank you to our donors. And for those who would like to be added to our donor list, here's our information. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Julio Torres for joining us. Dulce Acosta from USC, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your support. We do have one more question, I see. We have an attendee who's asking, do you know where the name Farmdale came from? Uh, good question, Hugo. You know, we haven't came across any kind of um, document stating why Farmdale. Uh, I'm assuming because it was a farming community, but other than that, you know, it's it's not, you know, I do know that while while uh, this area was pretty much farmland, um, everything around us, Alhambra, Boyle Heights, Lincoln Heights, you know, Highland Park, they were becoming uh, much more, um, you know, uh, dense in population, a lot more, a lot more um, tracts of homes were being built. So it could be that, you know, just the, the amount or lack of of, of uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> the growth of population just kept it so rural. And I think that's that might be a, a, a point that it was in Farmdale because everything else wasn't as, as farmable as, as this area was, you know, in the 1890s. You know, you go to, you go to uh, Boyle Heights in the 1890s, it's, it's you know, streets and, and homes and industry there. And, and here was uh, just laid back and very rural still, so. That's what I'm assuming could be part of the, the reason why Farmdale was the name they used. You know, and I also got an email just uh, yesterday uh, from a, a former resident that is talked about sheep herding. Well, I know you're asking about sheep herding. He remembers, um, well, you know, Ascot Hills. He, he lived on McPherson or Richelieu, actually. And he remembers that that hill sites in the 50s and 60s were still uh, sheep were still up there roaming around. And he asked if the Bats families were part of that. I don't think the Bats families were part of that in the 50s and 60s, but I knew the I do know the Basque, the, the just the Basque people, um, you, you know, still had sheep in the area, Highland Park, El Sereno, uh, into the 70s. So uh, I know sheep herding has something that you know was here to the 70s, and, and Elephant Hill probably, um, you know, Highland Park, Debs Park, even Ascot Hills had, had sheep in them because uh, there's much you know it, much more open space back then, of course, but um, and there's a there's a move to bring some of the sheep or goats back into our hillsides to be to control the the growth of you know of plants uh you know for the summertime so it won't be such a fire hazard but you know that's something we could always uh, talk about. Okay, I think that wraps up the questions we have. 
And so um, once again, thank you everybody for joining us and we please stay connected and we will be sending out updates um, for those of you who are um, part of our newsletter. And um, yeah, thank you. Have a good night.